Labour's track record is that they tried and failed in government to raise the amount we spend on science as a percentage of GDP. I met Shadow Minister for Universities, Science and Skills, Liam Byrne, at his constituency office in Birmingham and asked him what would be different if Labour forms the next government. There were three very big and very fundamental differences, um, which I kind of summarise as people, institutions and money. Um, let's take institutions first. Our universities are going bust. The current university finance system is going to put about 280 billion on the national debt by 2031. We can't afford that as a country. And if it's allowed to continue, then you know the institutions that power science in our country will collapse. So we've got to change that. We've got a plan to cut tuition fees that will actually take uh, 10 billion off uh, national debt by the end of the next parliament and put our universities back on a sustainable footing. So saving our institutions called universities, that's the first and most important thing. Second, we've got to make sure that um, we build what the Royal Society called this pipeline of talent for the years to come. We don't have a technical education system in this country worth its name and we've got to build one. And Tristram Hunt and I have set out how we can foster that 80,000 new apprenticeships, much bigger emphasis on STEM, technical education in schools, institutes of technical excellence in our further education system, and of course technical degrees to allow apprentices to study up to degree levels of skill. And then when it comes to money, this is one of the biggest differences that you've now got between the parties. I mean, the Conservatives are planning this roller coaster of spending cuts over the next parliament. They plan to do all the heavy lifting on closing the deficit, uh, with spending cuts, nothing on tax. That means there's a huge difference between us on how much money um, will go into the Department for Business, which of course is what pays the bills for science in this country. The British Science Association feels that somehow science isn't as fundamental a part of our culture as maybe politics or music or football. How would you alter that? Or do you yeah. think it's a problem? I think it's changing pretty fast actually. I think it's changing fundamentally for our children who are you know, probably the most entrepreneurial and innovation-minded generation that we've had in this country since Matthew Bolton and the Lunar Society were at work here in Birmingham, you know, a couple of centuries ago. So I think it's changing very quickly, and I think it actually it's our young people who are leading the way. OK. Um, the, the government's public attitude survey last year found that two-thirds of people think the government makes little or no effort to consult them over, over policy. I wonder there, again, if you feel that that's a problem, that there's a distance, and how you might go about changing that? Well, I think there's, a, there's been a pretty serious breakdown in trust between politicians and the public, and that's what I think you're hearing reflected in that consultation. So people, in my experience, you know, will often feel consulted about things, but they don't feel consulted seriously. They don't think consult, uh, consultations actually change much. You know, when you look at the way that the Lib Dems broke their pledge on tuition fees, I mean, that gets repeated back to me by young people who were 11 or 12 when that promise was first made. So politicians have to be very careful about being true to their word because otherwise it fosters this atmosphere of distrust that you do see reflected in survey results like that. Uh, well, th thinking about the, the recent uh, the Science Society of Biology debate, there was much mm. talk at the beginning of, of the need for consensus on science policy. Yeah. It felt very cosy. And it felt almost that you, that you feel that the coalition is sort of getting things right. Is that is that your position? That they've well, not I th done I th much wrong, really? I, I think that the coalition has done a good job in maintaining the uh, long-term framework for current spending. Uh, they kept some of the institutions that we created, like the Technology Strategy Board, now called Innovate UK. That's a, those are good things. Um, but the problem is, is that when you look at what the coalition or what the Conservatives are now planning on public spending, uh, on immigration, on our relationship with Europe, and on university finances, they risk a fundamental breakdown in the institutions, the ethos that powers the greatness in British science over the next four or five years. And so there are some fundamental differences between us on that. We're not going to put our relationship with Europe at risk. We're not going to carry on with their crazy immigration policies. We haven't got the same roller coaster of public spending cuts. And we've got a plan to save our university finance system. There's some big differences. OK, on, on GDP, um, the Green Party are the only people who've actually put a number on this and said, yeah. we're going to raise that to 1%, double it. Yeah. Um, are, are you going to match that? Uh, well, that will wait for our manifesto, and I'm not going to prejudge our manifesto, but I don't think the Green Party actually set out how they're going to pay for it today. And I think what a lot of people are having a problem with at the moment is differentiating the Green Party's long-term vision 
uh, like, for example, abolishing standing armed forces, um, raising aid spending, and their actual manifesto, what they want to deliver. In but one percent is not a great deal, is it? I mean, and it, uh, under Tony Blair, you were, were hoping to do better than that. Yeah. So why not say now we'll aim for that? Well, we're not we'll going to make. Go it, for that. We're not going to make any promises that we can't uh, commit to. Uh, that was the mistake that Nick Clegg made uh, before the last election. And so when our manifesto is set out in the next few days, that's when we'll set out our policies for science how, how and crucially where the money will come from. How important will science be in that manifesto? Because all the parties without fail, I'm sure you're going to say mm. the same to me, have said science is central to our future, it's yeah. central to the future of our country. And you, you look at the leaders' debate, there was no mention mm. of science, no mention of technology. Why? Why? Well, the leaders don't get to choose the questions in the leaders' debate, but if you they if you can look choose at, the answers. But if you if you look at what um, if you look at the analysis that Ed Miliband has set out for Britain, you can see the importance of science and technology. So we're trapped in this cost of living crisis. The only way that you can escape that as a nation is by earning your way to a better standard of living. That means you you need better paying jobs now. In Britain today, the knowledge economy is about a third of GDP. It's about a third of businesses. It's only twenty percent of jobs. If the knowledge economy was about a third of jobs in Britain, there'd be two and a half million extra high-skilled jobs in this country. And they pay, on average, 40% more a week than your regular job. So as a country, earning your way out of a cost-living crisis demands a bigger knowledge economy, and that, in turn, demands a bigger science and innovation base. So can we expect in your manifesto, then, that to achieve that, the percentage spent on our R&D in this country is going to go above oh, what it is now. Can you, give, can you give us a figure? <laughs> that same survey, the Public Attitude Survey last mm. year, found that a quarter of people were put off science at school. What mm. will you do at school level to, to, to improve that? So the most important thing is to ensure that there are qualified teachers in the classroom. Under this government, there's been about a 16% increase in unqualified teachers in the classroom. Uh, we know that that has a bad effect on encouraging children to take STEM subjects, and in particular, has a bad effect on encouraging girls to take science subjects. Now, we have to fix that. We have to um, ensure that there are only qualified teachers in the classroom, and, and that's going to mean that we've got to look again at this very ideology-driven approach to how we train teachers. So Mr Michael Gove's Teach Direct scheme um, has been winding down the number of teachers that are trained in our universities. And of course what that means is that when it comes to physics teachers or I believe maths teachers, we're dramatically missing our quotas each year for the supply of qualified teachers into the education system. So I'm the son of a science teacher. My mum was a head of science at some pretty tough comprehensive schools when I was growing up. I'm a great believer in the passion and force of having a professional qualified teacher inspiring young people into science and I think that's where we've got to start. There's been a lot of talk about um, problems with, with the, the rest of the world feeling that the Britain's no longer open to scientists. How would, how would you change that? that rhetoric really, it's out there now. So this is a really serious issue. We've had the first decline in international students for about 29 years. Um, and certainly when I was in India last year talking to students at Delhi University, I was just shocked by what they said. They said, you know, why is it that you don't want us to come anymore? Um, we, we have to change that. I think there's a couple of things that we can do. We can lift students out of the net migration target, but crucially, I think we can look at how we reintroduce uh, some kind of post-study work visa. That's been shown to have a huge impact on the demand for student places here in Britain. And when I was the immigration minister who introduced the point system uh, all those years ago, I went to enormous care to make sure that we had a post-study work visa system that was right, and it was a mistake for this coalition to abolish it. Um, they've, they've seen the light there on that, though, haven't they? They've, they've also I'm said they've sure. changed. Yeah. They have. Um, Seeing is believing. Okay. Can you put in a nutshell the three key ways that the public will see a difference um, if your party is in charge? Well, they'll see a university system that is still there after five years, and they'll see a lower cost for sending young people to university. Second, they will see a sensible, decent, real track for technical education if that's the way that you want to rise. Um, to the top of your profession. Those are the two most important things. But I think you'll also see um, just you know, a much stronger relationship and not a weaker relationship with Europe, and that is crucial to our science base. And perhaps most important of all, what they won't see is you know, north of £50 billion pounds worth of cuts that will hit the Department for Business really dramatically and risks actually destroying the pipeline of talent that we've got into science, technology and engineering.